the studios of KPFK Pacifica Radio in Los Angeles. This is Uprising and I'm Sonali Kohatkar. It's Monday, December 1st, 2014. Walmart workers and their allies stage 1600 protest across the nation on Black Friday. We'll speak with reporter Josh Idelson. And Dr. Paul Song joins us to break down the latest Supreme Court challenge to the Affordable Care Act, plus legal analyst and author of Suspicion Nation, Lisa Bloom, will dissect the legal flaws of the grand jury non-indictment of Darren Wilson. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Robert Jensen. He is an author and a professor of journalism at the University of Texas at Austin. Hi, Bob. Hello, Sonali. The U.S. and Turkey have reached a deal in the fight against Islamic State militants that involves a secure zone between the Turkey-Syria border. The agreement also allows the U.S. to use Turkish air bases from which to launch attacks. The Wall Street Journal, which reported the deal, speculated that the U.S. could send a quiet warning to the Assad regime to stay away from the zone or to risk retaliation. Just days earlier, the Syrian Foreign Minister Walid Mu'allam criticized the U.S. campaign against ISIS, saying it had not worked, primarily because Turkey's border with Syria was insecure. The U.S. is playing a complicated game, attempting to defeat one faction of the broad opposition facing the Syrian regime, while maintaining hostility against President Bashar al-Assad. For its part, Turkey, which Syria accuses of harboring militants, has been reluctant to join the U.S.-led fight until now. Well, Bob, the war started out as a delicate balance between this complicated set of allegiances, but it doesn't look like much has changed now, has it? Can you hear me, Bob? I'm sorry. There's some technical difficulties. You're back now. Uh, we're in, in the, the struggle around Syria, uh, the, comp, the, the idea that it's a game is, of course, accurate, although whenever there are human lives on the line, it, it seems flippant to call it a game. But we see here each, each actor, Turkey, the United States, Syria, Iran, they all have their own interests, and they're all playing this complicated game. Turkey, for instance, trying to claim a, a sort of superiority in the Sunni world, yet it, in conflict with a lot of the Arab states. Uh, the United States still not able to sort out its own role in this. Uh, I, I sort of, again, don't want to be flippant, but think back to days when analyzing the Middle East seems seemed easier than today when there are so many of these intersecting and conflicting goals. Uh, whatever it bodes for, it doesn't bode well for the Syrian people. And then a mass movement in Hong Kong for greater autonomy from China started out months ago as peaceful and even overly polite but has now seemingly grown tired of waiting for change. In the wake of inaction from Hong Kong's own leaders and China's silence, student activists this morning encircled government buildings, clashing with police. According to Reuters, the demonstrators defended themselves with, quote, wooden shields and metal barricades as they charged police forces sur chanting surround the government. The mass movement is seen as one of the biggest threats for China's Communist Party leadership since the Chinese student-led movement for democracy in 1989 that culminated in the Tiananmen Square massacre. Well, Bob, the Occupy-style protests in Hong Kong have been linked to U.S. interference because some groups have apparently received uh, funding from the National Endowment for Democracy, which is a U.S. Uh, agency, a government agency. How independent and sincere do you think this movement in Hong Kong is? Well, here we, we want to remember, of course, the United States has a long history of intervening in the internal affairs of other governments. So uh, the United States' hands have never been clean in these matters. But let's remember that most of that intervention, whether it was overt or covert, tended to be aimed at weak states that we could control in certain ways. Uh, China is not a weak state. So the idea that through the National Endowment for Democracy, the United States is somehow masterminding this opposition movement doesn't seem sensible to me. Does the U.S. want to influence such movements? Yes. Its, its ability to do that, however, it strikes me as extremely limited. So uh, one should never underestimate the, the possibility for nefarious action on the part of any government, the U.S. included, 
But this doesn't seem to me to be one of those uh, instances. And we'll certainly follow the story and see where Hong Kong's movement will wind up. Finally, Switzerland yesterday rejected a major referendum that would have restricted the numbers of immigrants entering their country. Voters were offered an initiative that reflected some concern about the entry of foreign workers. In voting it down, the Swiss government's treaties with the European Union remain intact as the EU requires a free movement of labor within its member states. Now, according to Al Jazeera, quote, almost a quarter of the eight million people living in Switzerland are foreigners, a statistic that is partly due to Switzerland's healthy economy and high salaries. The vote comes just days after UK Prime Minister David Cameron announced a harsh set of anti-immigrant policies, including cutting off government benefits to non-UK citizens. The UK will have to re-evaluate its EU membership if Cameron's Conservative Party is re-elected and enacts such measures. Now, um, Bob, what explains the difference between the UK and Switzerland on this issue? And could the UK break away from the EU over immigration? Well, remember, the UK has always been an outlier in Europe. It, it never joined the Eurozone. It didn't accept the common currency. The particular tenor of British politics is obviously always creates edge, even to some degree when there was a Labour government, but of course the Conservative government even more so. Remember also British politics is changing. The rise of right-wing parties, independence party that, that is anti-immigrant is certainly putting pressure on, on the Conservatives who are in a weak position. So I think this is mostly about the peculiar internal dynamics of British politics. But at a bigger level it also reminds us of the, the hypocrisy of this whole world system where capital and the corporations that control capital are fairly mobile across national boundaries, but people are not. Uh, and, and this is a, a problem we're gonna have to come to terms with, not only in Europe, but worldwide, where the disparities in wealth worldwide are going to take this form, and, and I think the tension around it is only gonna grow over the coming years. Bob Jensen, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks, Sonali. Robert Jensen is an author and a professor of journalism at the University of Texas at Austin. This is Uprising. We'll be right back. Back to Uprising, I'm Sonali Kohatkar. For the third year in a row, Walmart workers walked off the job on the busiest shopping day of the year to make their voices heard about low pay, managerial retaliation, and generally poor working conditions. In what were considered the largest such actions yet, the group Our Walmart coordinated protests and pickets at 1,600 stores around the country. In many stores, workers and their supporters were arrested. Some groups of workers went on a hunger strike. Some shoppers even joined marchers. And elected officials, such as city council members, expressed statements of support. In New York, activists chained a large food donation bin to the front of Alice Walton's Ritzy Park Avenue condo. Ms. Walton is the daughter of Walmart founder Sam Walton and is worth tens of billions of dollars. One of the world's largest employers, Walmart made nearly $500 billion of sales last year. My guest is Josh Idelson. He's a reporter for Bloomberg, Bis Bloomberg Business Week and a former salon writer who has closely followed the Our Walmart Black Friday protests. Welcome to Uprising, Josh. Uh, unfortunately, we're having some trouble uh, getting Josh on the air with us, and we hope to have him on very soon. Again, we are talking about the Black Friday protests that took place over the weekend. Of course, on Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, considered the biggest shopping day of the year. And it looks like we do have Josh on with us. Uh, welcome to Uprising, Josh. 
Thank you for having me back. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, first, how significant were the protests these year, both in terms of the size and the impact that they've had on Walmart itself? So according to organizers, there were hundreds of Walmart employees who went on strike, tens of thousands of people who protested, 1,600 U.S. Walmart stores that had some kind of demonstration. For perspective, the very first of these Black Friday strikes in 2012, organizers said 500 some Walmart employees went on strike over the course of that week. Uh, a figure was not released by the campaign last year. Again, this year so far, they've said they can confirm there were hundreds of Walmart employees. So it's not clear that this campaign, which has been faced with credible allegations that Walmart has fired dozens of people who have been involved, it, it's not clear that this campaign in the two years since bursting onto the scene has been able to grow in terms of the number of Walmart employees it can mobilize to walk off the job. Hmm. It has it has seen changes from Walmart or announcements of policy changes that address some of the issues in modest or incremental ways that have been rallying cries of this campaign around workers' hours, around minimum wage pay, around pregnancy and the accommodation for workers who are pregnant, a, a sub-campaign of our Walmart called Respect the Bump. And so the campaign is able to point to ways that Walmart has made high-profile moves either addressing things that are in the headlines or things that the campaign has made a major issue of. Walmart, of course, continues to say, well, we always listen to our associates and we're not doing anything in particular in response to these protests, which the retailer remains dismissive of. And, and I want to pick up on what you just said. Uh, Corey Lundberg, uh, Walmart's communication director, said to Al Jazeera, most of our associates are very happy. And the Al, Al Jazeera report that quoted him said that he pointed out that Walmart changed its scheduling practices in April to allow hourly workers to sign up for extra shifts, and that over 170,000 associates were promoted to better positions in the past year. He also said that the majority of associates are full-time and earn close to and uh, close to half earn at least $25,000 a year, which is also one of the major and very specific demands that Walmart workers had been making. What do you make of this assertion? And so uh, does it seem as though if we do measure it by what Walmart has done, even if they are incremental changes, this movement has had an effect? Well, again, Walmart insists that the movement has not had an effect, but certainly we have seen these kinds of announcements. We've seen other announcements. We've seen TV ads, uh, to much like recently the, the Koch brothers ads that go on TV and say, look, here's all the great things we're doing. Companies that weren't previously make an extra investment in that kind of positive public attention when they're facing negative public attention that they don't like. And so it, it does appear by all signs that there has been some impact. That said, Walmart is an existential threat to <clears throat> the labor movement in the United States. Hmm. Walmart's business model not only it has a downward impact in the retail sector, but on suppliers, it's something that's being aped by competitors. It demonstrates the way that American capitalism in many ways is going in terms of this non-union model, this low-wage model, this just-in-time production model. And unions historically have failed over and over again, either to get collective bargaining at Walmart, which our Walmart claims it doesn't want, or to overhaul the business model, to make it a model that isn't going to drive down standards elsewhere as well. And so this campaign can point to incremental change. In the 50-some year history of Walmart, there has not been a challenge as strong as this one in the United States by Walmart workers. And at the same time, in the large scheme of things, Walmart's business model remains one that poses a very real threat to what organized labor has tried to achieve in the United States, and it's not clear that this campaign has been able to dramatically grow in the past couple of years in terms of the willingness of Walmart workers to right. take the risk of getting involved. Now, that last year, there was this huge controversy over the fact that in some Walmart stores, management put out food donation bins for their workers, and it might have been in response to uh, that incident that activists changed this oversized uh, food donation bin to the outside of Alice Walton's Park Avenue ap uh, apartment, right? Uh, the bin had a message, we don't want charity, we want decent pay. 
uh, printed on the side. And uh, sort of following up on that, Corey Lundberg, the uh, communications director of Walmart, explained why so many Walmart workers are in food assistance programs. He said, there is a reason that the hungry people choose to come to work for us. The Walmart job is a good job. What do you make of that? Well, uh, obviously, you can argue it from either direction. Uh, I, I don't think that the protesters would disagree with the fact that some people who are poor go choose to go and work at Walmart and hope that working at Walmart will be better than not having a job. That doesn't strike me as a super compelling defense of standards at Walmart. And the, the way that Walmart, like fast food industry, often defends its standards is to say, well, so many of the people in our management positions started out as rank and file employees, which is, is somewhat like saying, well, it's not bad to be an American. So many of the people in the U.S. Senate started out as regular Americans <laughs> who were not in the U.S. Senate. Well, sure, but that doesn't mean that the average American has a terrific chance of becoming a U.S. Senator. Right. And so, as you said, Walmart has acknowledged that less than half of its employees make over $25,000 a year. That The fact that this is our largest employer and our employer that in many ways is driving standards in its own industry and other industries tells you something about where the U.S. economy is and, and what work is like in the U.S. now, as well as when you consider other, other aspects of the work, like the complaints that workers have had about not being able to rely on a particular schedule. Now, uh, the, uh, the criticism that the right has flung at the Our Walmart movement involves the fact that a union is backing it. Glenn Spencer, who's with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, recently criticized Our Walmart, saying, quote, the UFCW effectively owns, operates, and funds Our Walmarts and its protests. This reality becomes apparent upon examination of the UFCW's annual Department of Labor filing, in which it states the UFCW has a substantial subsidiary organization maintained in Washington, D.C., named the Organization United for Respect at Walmart. So what is the problem with the UFCW running this? I mean, this is a, an organized labor group trying to organize labor, right? So uh, my colleague at Business Week, Susan Burfield, did a, a very good, very important feature some time ago about the origins of our Walmart. And certainly the UFCW has been the key backer, the key player behind our Walmart, and that should not surprise people. And why is that uh, a dirty, Walmart. dirty secret, though? Right? I mean, shouldn't UFCW proudly uh, be front and center? And uh, why should the right have a problem with this? Well, uh, the reason the right has a problem with it is that the right, broadly speaking, has a problem with unions. Right. Whether the UFCW and our Walmart should talk about their relationship the way they do it, it is a different question. But it certainly. But unions have a problem in the United States, which is, among others, that the fastest growing jobs in this country are not unionized jobs. And the direction that these industries are going is not good for attempts to raise standards and have some kind of democracy in the workplace. And so it, it would be malpractice for the OCW not to be investing in trying to change Walmart either by winning collective bargaining, which again, OCW and our Walmart insist that they're not doing, or by overhauling the standards there so that it doesn't lead to the kind of threat we've seen and unionized UFCW workplaces, like the supermarket industry, where you had a strike that both sides agree was largely driven by competitive pressure from Walmart on the supermarkets. Now, whether this is an effective strategy is a more complicated question. And in, in a sense, everything organized labor has tried in recent decades, it's tried at Walmart. It's tried traditional National Labor Relations Board campaigns. It's tried air war efforts, what, what you could call the corporate campaign, where you, you drum up a bunch of ads and, and public relations without a lot of involvement from workers. And so the question that a lot of people have had after those efforts about this, our Walmart campaign is, to what extent is this another version of the corporate campaign where it's largely an air war? And to what extent is this 
a mass movement of Walmart employees that can actually wield some kind of industrial power mm -hmm. in order to threaten the company in a different way. Finally, um, Josh, how seriously has the parallel movement by workers such as those in the fast food industry influenced this Our Walmart movement? And, and what about cities like Seattle, where uh, the city council has voted to raise a minimum wage to $15 an hour in the midterm elections? We saw uh, several other uh, parts of the country do the same. Do you see Our Walmart as the, this movement as part of this conglomeration of efforts? Sure. We've seen in recent years, I wrote about it Business Week, the rise of this one-day minority strike model where you have strikes that aren't shutting down production or emptying out the store, but are instead about engaging the public and coworkers and disrupting the company's brand, disrupting its relationship with its clients. And the Walmart strikes are a signal example of this. The fast food strikes, which sprung up right around the same time with some of the same backers are a equally high profile example. And certainly when you have an incremental success for one of these campaigns, it fuels the others. And there was a, a symbolic demonstration of this in the Walmart workers deciding, well, now we're going to take up $15 as our rallying cry as well, because when it was taken up by fast food workers, something that some journalists might have expected would be laughed out of the room, $15 has become at the center of the wage debate. Right. And so certainly when you see efforts spread in, in one sector of the low-wage economy, it has an impact elsewhere. We've seen that even within the Walmart supply chain with the spread of strikes from guest workers at CJ's Seafood to Walmart warehouses to Walmart's retail stores themselves. Well, Josh, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. We will link to your website, joshidelson.com, from ours later today, uprising with sonali.com. Thanks so much, Josh. Thank you very much. Josh Idelson is a reporter for Bloomberg Business Week. He has been writing about the Black Friday protests and the Our Walmart movement. This is Uprising. When we come back, we'll take a look at the latest legal challenge facing the Affordable Care Act. And then Lisa Bloom joins us to analyze the non-indictment of Darren Wilson. Stay tuned. <laughs> This is Uprising. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Now, you can now watch the TV version of Uprising on Free Speech TV, which is available on DirecTV and Dish Network, as well as Roku. If you don't have access to any of that, check out our YouTube channel. We're at youtube.com slash uprising with Sonali. We are just under 100 subscribers away from our goal of 1,000, so we hope you'll subscribe today. Again, that's youtube.com slash uprising with Sonali. And yet another legal challenge to the Affordable Care Act. The Supreme Court decided last month to hear the case King versus Burwell. At the heart of the case is what may simply be sloppy wording in one sentence of the original bill, which became President Obama's signature law. Essentially, as now written, the law offers subsidies to low-income Americans who purchase health insurance on a state-run exchange such as covered California. But because 36 states opted not to run their own health insurance exchanges, primarily because of Republican governors' opposition, millions of Americans have bought their plans through the federal health exchange, healthcare.gov. The nation's highest court will now decide whether those Americans are eligible to receive subsidies, thereby undermining the entire basis of what both supporters and detractors is referred to as Obamacare. Joining me in studio today is Paul Song. He is a radiation oncologist and also on the board of Physicians for a National Health Program and People for the American Way. He's also the executive chairman of the Courage Campaign. Welcome to Uprising, Paul. Thank you for having me. Welcome back. You've been on our program before to talk about uh, Obamacare, quote unquote, and I know that you are both a, uh, a critic of it from the left and also a supporter because it uh, is something that the right doesn't want and better than nothing. So let's talk about what's at the heart of this latest legal challenge. And I should say the Supreme Court has already taken up the Affordable Care Act 
declared it constitutional. This happened two years ago, but this latest uh, case is centered around Section 1311, the, uh, which is, uh, as it's written now, uh, based on subsidies. And, and it just so happens that it says those subsidies are for a uh, nonprofit entity or government agency that is established by a state. Did the people who drafted the law really mean to say that only in cases that people got their health uh, health care, um, health insurance through uh, the state, would they get subsidies, and that if they bought it in the federal marketplace, they wouldn't get subsidies? Did they mean that? Well, it's hard to say what the intent was, except uh, that I think when this was drafted, I don't think they ever anticipated that all these governors would line up and say that they wouldn't, uh, you know, set up an, an exchange in their own states. So it's really, we're looking at the people that are between 138 percent and 400 percent of the poverty, federal poverty level. Those are the people that that would qualify for a subsidy. And in those states where the Republican governors have essentially refused that, technically uh, that is the question of this lawsuit, that in those states, because it says the subsidies would go to people and exchanges only set up in states, not by the federal government, uh, that's where you've had this, this real dis, um, disagreement. So you had the D.C. Federal uh, Circuit Court say that absolutely this is not um, uh, applicable. And they overturned it, and they said this should uh, that the plaintiff should win. And then you had immediately after um, uh, several hours later a court in Richmond saying that no, 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 that wasn't the intent. That reality is whether it's a federal or state that should all apply under the Affordable Care Act. This is going to be the real issue of the Supreme Court. And it's interesting because if the Supreme Court were to rule in favor of the plaintiffs in this case, it would essentially amount to discrimination, right? Um, class discrimination based on where one lives, which state one lives in. And, and how can that be constitutional, although... <laughs> although we're seeing that with the Medicaid expansion as well. Yeah. But, but what's really ironic is, so the gentleman that brought this forward, uh, he has an annual salary of 20000 a year, he has a flooring company, and he was basically saying that if he decided not to participate, that the individual mandate would basically uh, mandate that he would have to pay a penalty of $100 a year. Or if he had signed up for the exchange, we're talking about he would only have to pay $18 a month for full health care coverage. And so based on that, you had a lot of people that were much more powerful and have a lot more money that were basically saying, okay, we'll fund this uh, lawsuit to basically get our point across that it really comes down to the wording. Hmm. So because uh, there is an in, there's a mandate that everybody get health insurance as part of this law and there are subsidies to help people get them, this person is saying, I should be able to choose not to get them. The subsidies... Um, are helping me too much and I don't want to be helped because he is saying that he is more concerned about federal taxpayers and deficit. I mean, this sounds basically like the Tea Party. It, it really is. And here is somebody, again, that in the past, by his own admission, could not afford health insurance. And he's saying that the individual mandate makes it very, he would have to buy something he couldn't afford. That 8% of his salary is something that he couldn't afford, but he doesn't realize that with the subsidies, he would only have to pay $18 a month which is really uh, a couple cigarette uh, boxes of cigarettes a month that he could defer and end up uh, having health care. So he was upset that he couldn't afford it and then upset that he could. <laughs> exactly. And I think it was one of those things where he, without really looking at how it would really help himself, um, just like a lot of people, unfortunately, who pay attention to uh, things that they're told rather than how it really affects their daily life, decided to... to, to to bring this suit forward. So let's talk about some of the ideological forces behind this. Michael Cannon of the Cato Institute has fixated on this ambiguous wording in Section 1311 of the Affordable Care Act for a long time now. Is the Supreme Court essentially, in taking this case, up pandering to the likes of him? Uh, it, it's really hard to say what the Supreme Court is saying. I think the reason that they were forced to take this up and, and not being a lawyer is that you had two circuit courts that had opposing uh, opinions on this, and as a result, somebody had to be the arbiter of that. Um, it, it will be really um, uh, a big blow to, to as you mentioned, uh, roughly five million people if the Supreme Court decides to uh, rule on that one word and say that this is void. Hmm. Now, the Supreme Court, uh, when it took up the constitutionality of the ACA in 2012, it was a five to four decision to hold it constitutional. The four people who voted, the four justices who voted against the law were Alito, Thomas, Kennedy, and Scalia. Uh, and I'm wondering if you think that those are the four suspects who might uh, attempt again to 
vote against uh, the law in this case? And if so, will there be another sort of deciding uh, uh, vote if they are able to lure one more justice to join them? <laughs> it, 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 that's well. That's the real thing. If you look at all of the pundits that are out there, the legal experts, they're not sure how the Supreme Court is going to rule. Uh, some feel that Justice Roberts may actually side with them this time, whereas before he wrote uh, an opinion that seemed like he was going to side with them, but voted in favor of uh, maintaining the Affordable Care Act. Hmm. So it, if the um, Supreme Court votes in favor, uh, rules in favor uh, of the plaintiffs who are challenging this law based on the sloppy wording, um, it would only apply to those Americans who have uh, purchased their insurance through healthcare.gov, but not people who live in states like California, where this program is produced, states like Kentucky. And Kentucky is an interesting example, and I'm wondering if you can um, talk about how successful, for one thing, the state-run exchanges have been, and for another thing, how popular, or in general, Obamacare has been in red states. Well, um, again, in a lot of the red states that failed to implement their own, I think uh, Kentucky is probably the one that has been the model of success. You had a governor, Governor Brashear, there who really embraced it along with a lot of the legislature. Um, so if, if this were to be repealed in some of the other states, I think that would be the real problem. Um, but we should point out, it's not just um, red states where some of this will be repealed. Other states like Oregon and Vermont had trouble establishing their own exchanges, and as a result, at the last minute, had to have the federal government step in. So people in some non-red states uh, that have more progressive clientele, just by nature of their states not being able to set up their own exchanges properly, may fall subject to this as well. How popular has the law been? I mean, despite all of its huge flaws, one of which is probably led to this because it's such a complex law that there were perhaps bound to be such complications arising. How popular is it? I can only say what I've seen in my own patients. Yeah. So being an oncologist, I see a lot of patients who've uh, basically used up their maximum caps and had to start paying out of pocket for health care because they've had long, chronic fights with cancer who no longer have that and benefit from that. I've seen people who were now able to have access because of the Medicaid expansion. So while I have, as you mentioned, uh, believed we could have done a better health care system with single-payer Medicare for all, I do see tangible benefits in a lot of patients now. Is it perfect? No. But I think more and more people are seeing benefits of it. And, and a lot of people are finding health care to be much more affordable. And particularly in California, where we have a lot of small business owners or people in the entertainment industry who don't have sustainable in, uh, income and jobs where they have health care through their employers, this has been a real godsend. Hmm. So um, what is the fix? I mean, obviously, the Supreme Court um, uh, or obviously Congress could have fixed this by simply amending the law to fix the, you know, what Paul Krugman has called a, a death by typo. Um, and, and it's possible that the Supreme Court could order Congress to do this, but given the makeup of Congress now, and certainly in January, that's less likely. Is there another fix? Well, uh, so the, one of the, probably the simplest way, but again, this is, runs against the ideological principles of, of Republican governors, many of whom were reelected, is for the state to uh, set up a state incorporated entity that would then subcontract out to federal uh, healthcare.gov uh, rather than, quote, having their own exchange. But if they're not willing to first try to set up their state exchange, then these people will be left out in the cold. What about uh, ways in which the federal government's healthcare.gov could be a sort of outside contractor for states to be able to say, uh, we are running it and we're simply, you know, paying the federal government to do it? Well, that, that's the, the amazing part. There's a lot of federal money for states still to set up their exchanges. Uh, so it doesn't have to come out of their own budgets. And that was one of the things that a lot of the Republican governors were concerned about. But by, if they set up an exchange just in name only and immediately uh, hired an independent um, contractor to operate it, that independent contractor could then go ahead and subcontract through uh, uh, healthcare.gov. And just in a blink of an eye, it's something that they wouldn't have to really spend a dime for, uh, and they would get reimbursed for whatever costs that they have. Uh, it, it could stop this nonsense right away. Hmm. So that is something that state uh, legislatures could do. But again, because we have these uh, ideologically driven Republicans in gubernatorial
gubernatorial positions around the country, many of them won their seats again, many of them uh, uh, in states that, for example, voted to raise the minimum wage. Um, we see this very strange um, ideological break between constituents and those in office. And sometimes there seems to be confusion even among constituents who might on some you know, theoretical level oppose Obamacare because it's coming from President Obama, but then benefit from it really uh, personally and perhaps enjoy, uh, you know, en enjoy the, the, the perks of not going bankrupt. Right, and that's the thing that most, there have been numerous polls that if you remove the Obamacare name oh. and just tout the principles and what the actual Affordable Care Act does, people generally embrace it. But once you put Obama's name on it, immediately half of our electorate is turned off. I think that we saw that, that a lot of people are not willing to vote their best interests and they're rather willing to vote for what they've been told by various uh, uh, news outlets. And just as an aside, is this a Democrat Republican thing or is this a black white thing? <laughs> is this a race uh, thing or is this a you know, as, as somebody, thing? So, so <laughs> as somebody whose uh, mom ran a Head Start in New York, New Jersey, and whose mentor was Shirley Chisholm, mm. um, and I have an African American best man, um, I would have to say that race is still a big part of this. Yeah. He is a black president and it turns off. A lot of Americans. Finally, let's um, let's talk about what is up ahead for Obamacare. Um, in states like California, where state-run uh, health exchanges have been quite successful, mm -hmm. there were obviously some hiccups in the beginning. What is the prospect for transition to single payer? Well, I, I think it's going to be a long road, but one that we should still continue to educate our population about. The, we saw that just in this last election, just trying to pass an initiative statewide that would have given the insurance commissioner the right to regulate rates, how quickly that died. So imagine if we completely remove the private insurance industry out of the process. But the Affordable Care Act does allow for states in 2017 to apply for a waiver that would allow them to implement their own uh, health care system if it was above and beyond what was mandated in the Affordable Care Act. So you have states like Vermont that are trying to implement a single-payer uh, bill. But even in a state of like Vermont where there's only 600,000 employees, uh, 600,000 citizens, the, the opposition has started to grow and the amount of money that's being spent to defeat this by the private insurance industry is enormous. So we need to continue to, to tout the benefits of the Affordable Care Act, show where we can improve on it, and educate our population that uh, government-run health care is not what they th think this is. The Affordable Care Act is not government-run health care, but Medicare is, and Medicare is much more successful than anything else that we have right now. Paul, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Is the best website uh, Courage Campaigns to check out to work on this? Uh, I, well, there are several. Uh, I would recommend they go to Campaign for Healthy California. Uh, there's also uh, um, the CourageCampaign.org uh, where we can learn about, people can learn about all these issues. And we will post those to our website, UprisingWithSonali.com, later today. Thank you so much, as always, for joining Thanks us. For having me. Thank Paul you. Song is my guest. He is a radiation oncologist. He is also the executive chairman of the Courage Campaign and sits on the board for of Physicians for a National Health Program and People for the American Way. This is Uprising. When we come back, we'll take a look at some of the legal issues surrounding the non-indictment of Darren Wilson in light of the ongoing protests in Ferguson and around the country. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Uprising. I'm Sonali Kolhatkar. It wasn't just Walmart workers who chose the biggest shopping day of the year to make their demands. Activists angered over the St. Louis grand jury decision to not indict former Ferguson officer Darren Wilson, but charges relating to the shooting death of teenager Michael Brown also called for a boycott in protest. 
In fact, under the banner of hashtag blackout, protesters shut down the St. Louis Galleria Mall. Solidarity protests were held in cities around the country. In Oakland, activists occupied a BART station and shut it down, leading to more than a dozen arrests. In Los Angeles, where the largest number of people outside Ferguson have been arrested, more than 300, people blocked freeways. In Ferguson itself, tensions remain high as people continue their protests despite a short lull during Thanksgiving. A church attended by Michael Brown's father was burnt down in the past week. Some suspect members of the KKK of being behind the possible arson attack. Meanwhile, since the grand jury decision was announced last week, legal experts and scholars have examined the evidence released and the procedure itself, concluding that the entire process could have been flawed right from the start. Darren Wilson himself has reportedly been paid half a million dollars for sharing his story with the press, saying that he had a clear conscience. My guest is Lisa Bloom. She's a legal analyst for the Today Show, NBC News, and Avo.com. She's the New York Times bestselling author of Swagger and Think. Her latest book is Suspicion Nation, the inside story of the Trayvon Martin injustice and why we continue to repeat it. She runs her own law firm in Los Angeles called The Bloom Firm. Welcome to Uprising, Lisa. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, one of the things that been, has been making the rounds of social media is an opinion written by Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia in the 1992 case of United States versus uh, Williams, and in it he explained what the role of a grand jury was, that its function is to uh, not to inquire upon what foundation the charge may be denied or otherwise to try the suspect's defenses, but only to examine upon what foundation the charge is made by the prosecutor. And so he basically made the case that the uh, person uh, has never been thought to have a right to testify or to have exculpatory evidence presented. How unusual was it for Darren Wilson to directly address the grand jury in uh, that's deciding whether or not to indict him and to present exculpatory evidence. What you're pointing out is such an important issue. Look, the first problem here is that Michael Brown was shot and killed. The second problem is the completely biased way in which this grand jury proceeding was handled. So different from the way that other grand juries go down in this country and indeed in St. Louis. Indeed, this very grand jury, which I'd heard a number of other cases before they turned to this matter, and all of the other cases were handled according to standard operating procedures which is you put on one or two witnesses just have a little bit of evidence to establish probable cause the defendant is charged and then they prepare for a full-blown trial or a plea bargain more likely in this case it was completely different and I've read a substantial part of the thousands of pages of this grand jury uh, of the transcripts and the prosecutors even in that grand jury room say over and over again this case is different we're doing everything different in this grand jury room which is completely contrary by the way to what the prosecutor Bob McCullough said in his press conference that this was handled like any other grand jury. I mean, that is a completely false statement. So what do you make of the photographs that uh, were presented of Darren Wilson's injuries? He said he had a facial contusion, but honestly, the photos show a slight reddening on the side of his jaw. Um, and, and of course, he was able to talk directly to the grand jury in presenting this. From looking at mm -hmm. those photographs, how would you judge them? Well, what's completely outrageous outrageous to me as a trial lawyer is that Darren Wilson was never asked any tough questions. Mm -hmm. And the one that jumped out at me immediately was his story that Mike Brown punched him full force, he said, twice in the face. Mike Brown, a big, strong, healthy young man, if he had punched him full force twice in the face, you would expect more than what we see in those photos. If you look at those photos, and it's about two or three pages in the transcript where they're saying, you know, where is the injury? Can I see it? Maybe mm -hmm. it's another photograph. Let me look at a different one. I still don't see it. Maybe this photograph. And if you look at the photos, as I have, you sort of turn them sideways and squint. You can kind of sort of see a little pinkness or a little redness on his face. It is completely inconsistent with his story. Add to that that the redness is on the right side of his face. Now, he is, sta he is sitting in the car, as I am to you. I, I am the Darren Wilson person, right? On the right side, he says that Mike Brown punched him with the right hand. How he would have reached around through the car all the way around to the right side is really hard to believe. It's possible. But let's see you reenact it, Mr. Wilson. Mm -hmm. You shot and killed an unarmed kid. I don't think it's too much to ask in a grand jury proceeding. Let's have a reenactment. Let's bring in a mannequin. And let's see how this all works together and if your story is even possible. None of that happened. In fact, we know that Darren Wilson was allowed to wash his hands a couple of times. We know that his gun was never fingerprinted to prove one of the most important parts of his story. He says that Mike Brown grabbed the gun, not just reached for it, but grabbed it, and that they were both 
both um, having a skirmish back and forth with the gun. He says Mike Brown turned it in towards his pelvis. Let's see the fingerprints on the gun. We know there's blood on the gun. Blood can travel through the air. Fingerprints can't. Why on earth was that gun not fingerprinted? And I call on the federal investigators now. It's not too late. Fingerprint that gun. Show me Michael Brown's fingerprints on that gun. In his testimony to the grand jury, Wilson said, when I grabbed him, the only way I can describe it is I felt like a five-year-old holding on to Hulk Hogan. I felt another one of those punches in my face could knock me out or, or worse. Uh, he was He's obviously bigger than I was and stronger, and I've taken a t already taken two to the face, and I didn't think I would, et cetera. The third would be fatal if he hit yes. me right. But Wilson is only one inch shorter than Mike Brown was. Right. Actually, Darren Wilson testified he's six foot four. Yeah. And Michael Brown, uh, I guess, is six foot four, according to whatever. Maybe six, or foot six five. five or something. Okay. Yeah. So, so they're, they're about roughly the, same, the height. same height. Mike Brown did way more, but Officer Wilson is in a car with a gun. No one asked him, for example, why he didn't press the gas on the car to get away. If Mike Brown's reaching in through the window, step on the gas, Mike Brown might have broken an arm, but he wouldn't have been dead from that. Nobody asked him these tough questions. You know, and this is what really gets me because as a trial lawyer I love cross-examination this is what we live for if you're a litigator as I am right I can read this transcript and cross-examination questions just jump out at me and I've been tweeting them all all week yeah. and, you know they're not difficult right for example you, you compare a uh, Darren Wilson's first statement where he said Mike Brown struck him ten times to his grand jury statement where he says Mike Brown struck him twice mm. ask him to explain that inconsistency why are the eyewitnesses who are supportive of Mike Brown ask tough questions questions in that jury room and not Darren Wilson. That's something the prosecutors have never answered. Now, uh, Mike Brown also told the grand jury that, uh, I mean, rather, Darren Wilson told the grand jury that Mike Brown looked like a demon and, mm. you know, he used the word Hulk Hogan. I mean, what do you make of this? Uh, we, we hear this often where police are, um, you know, when they're asked to justify uh, even weekly, uh, why they might have killed in particular African American men have tended to create this de the literally demonizing yes. uh, m black men as somehow immune to pain, as somehow yes. superhuman, able, and able to, to run to through bullets. Uh, yes, you know, he also says he, he seems so surprised that Mike Brown was angry after he'd been shot that he had an angry look on his face after he'd been shot. Listen, I think what you're pointing to is the dehumanization yeah. of black men. And keep in mind that everything that Darren Wilson said was after a month and a half of being able to meet with his lawyer to go over all of the evidence. And still, he comes up with this kind of language. I, I think that the eyewitness, Dorian Johnson, who was Mike Brown's friend, has a more plausible story. He says that both men looked angry. And surely both did. And if Mike Brown were here and he were alive and he could testify, I'm sure he would say, Darren Wilson had a very scary look on his face. The bottom line is, a scary look on a face is not enough to shoot and kill someone. Police should be trained with better tactics. It shocked me that Darren Wilson said he had the option of carrying a taser, but he didn't carry a taser because it was uncomfortable in his belt. Well, is it more comfortable to have young people shot and killed? You know, we need to retrain police officers, not only so that they're always wearing a camera. And Ferguson police, by the way, have been given cameras, donated uh, for free by a private company. Still, they're not wearing them. They're also not even wearing name tags uh, much of the time. Wow. Um, but they need to carry a taser, whether it's uncomfortable or not. And I'm not a huge fan of tasers, but tasers are far better than shooting and killing somebody with a gun. Right. Now, w McCullough, Robert McCullough, the uh, county prosecuting attorney, made a big deal uh, in his preamble with the grand jury decision about this alleged robbery committed by Mike Brown on the day he was killed, saying that, in fact, Brown stole some cigarillos from a convenience store. Uh, but as far as I can tell, the store owner never called 911 to report it. Uh, Wilson may not have known to look for a suspect of Brown's description. Um, so why did he even bring it up, saying essentially that Wilson, or implying that Wilson approached Brown because he thought he was a suspect in a robbery? Right. Well, what Wilson has sort of two parts of his story, and nobody bore down to get clarity on this. He says that initially he stopped the two young men because they were walking in the street. And he says he said very politely to them to get out of the street. Dorian Wilson says he was very rude. He said, get the F out of the street and then screeched his tires, backed up, almost hit them. If they hadn't stepped aside, they would have been hit. I think that story is also more consistent with what the community has been saying for a long time about how they're treated by the police. Darren Wilson says then once he looked at Mike Brown and he saw the cigarillos in his hand, he realized, and, and how he was dressed, he realized that he was the suspect from that shoplifting incident. My view is, is that at trial, 
probably the shoplifting incident would not come in. It would be considered inadmissible, more prejudicial than probative, we say. Darren Wilson, if he testified at a trial, uh, would be able to talk about what he heard on the radio. But all of this about the uh, cigarillos being stolen, as you say, the, the shop owner never called in. It was apparently a customer who called in. And that video that many on the right see as, as Mike Brown being very domineering and overbearing, you know, others say he was simply having an, a verbal altercation with one of the customers. He moved the customer aside because the customer was blocking his path out and he, he got out of the store. Bottom line is, we don't have the death penalty for shoplifting in America. Even if he had shoplifted a handful of cigarillos, which a few dollars worth of cigarillos, uh, there's certainly a lot better ways to handle this in a non-lethal manner. Right. What do you make of the fact that on uh, July 25th, 2014, this was just two weeks before Michael Brown was killed. Now, I don't know if you've heard of this. Mike, uh, Robert McCullough apparently announced that he would prosecute an officer named Dewan Gore. He's one of the few black officers on the force. And Gore's apparent crime was for striking a man's hand with his baton. If he's convicted of second degree assault, he could be imprisoned for up to seven years. And Dewan Gore is saying that his case represents a double standard. He's even joined the protests in Ferguson. Well, it clearly does. It clearly does. We know that Bob McCullough has never prosecuted a police officer in his jurisdiction for homicide, even though a number of young men, generally African American, have been killed. He called the victims, two shooting victims of police a few years ago, bums. Mm -hmm. This is after they were already deceased. Uh, he refused to step aside, even though about 70,000 people signed a petition asking him to recuse himself. You know, the appearance of impropriety in our justice system is so important, and judges and prosecutors are supposed to step aside, even if technically they may not have done anything wrong, just so that we all have trust and faith in the system. And by refusing to recuse himself, what he did was set up the community for the outcome that we now have. This suspicion, this fear, this mistrust. If this had been done properly, I think people could accept the outcome, whatever it was a lot better if there had been fairness. But what we see from the grand jury transcripts is such a lack of fairness, such a different way of treating Darren Wilson compared to all of the other witnesses. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, and we should bring up the, uh, Robert McCullough's background. He uh, has a history, as you've said, uh, of supporting uh, the police force. And his own father was apparently uh, killed by a black suspect. Um, so this should have made it pretty clear that he had a conflict of interest. What do you make of his preamble? His lengthy preamble on uh, last week when the announcement was finally made, when he made the announcement, late in the evening, hours after apparently the grand jury had already come to a decision. Some say he sounded like Wilson's defense attorney. Yeah, that's that's what I said. That's what I tweeted immediately. Mm. This is a great presentation. I probably read it there. <laughs> <laughs> this is a great presentation by Darren Wilson's defense attorney. Oh, wait, this is the prosecutor. And, you know, what's striking is that Bob McCullough, except for the first day when he introduced himself and his assistant prosecutors, he wasn't in the grand jury room. And so for him to be making conclusions on national television before all the world about these witnesses, he wasn't there listening to them, watching them testify. So I assume he was getting reports from his assistant prosecutors, but for him to be making sweeping generalizations, uh, one of the most important things he talked about was, well, there's a conflict among eyewitness testimonies. Well, shock of all shocks. You know, in every That's case, common. there's a conflict. Yeah. Literally in every case. Mm -hmm. If there are multiple eyewitnesses to a traumatic, shocking event, like a shooting and killing of someone, there are going to be conflicts. There are going to be differences in testimony. If that were a reason not to charge someone, we would no longer be the land of mass incarceration, right? We could open up our prison doors right now. Instead, that's why we have trials. And when there are six members of the community, five of whom didn't know either man involved in this incident, who say Mike Brown was shot with his hands up, that is far more than you need for probable cause. You charge the man, then you have a full-blown trial. Nobody is denying that Darren Wilson is entitled to a defense. Of course he's entitled to a defense, like anybody. But Mike Brown is entitled to a voice in the courtroom. And my a strong objection is that there was no voice for Mike Brown in that grand jury room. There was no one advocating for what he might have said. No one advocating against Darren Wilson. Nobody asking difficult questions. Nobody pointing out that Darren Wilson's story didn't match up with the physical evidence. It was such a lopsided, one-sided type of proceeding uh, that, of course, the community is angry about it.
Hmm. So you mentioned the federal investigation that there's still time, but don't these things don't the don't federal investigations take a really long time? Aren't they still investigating Trayvon Martin's killing? Well, it, that's a good question about whether they are still investigating Trayvon. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if they are. Huh. Uh, I'm not impressed uh, with this Justice Department's prosecution of civil rights cases. Uh, mostly, what we see are non prosecutions, and so I don't. You know, I, I've I've actually wondered what is going on. I've heard some rumors that maybe they're still investigating. I don't think there's anything more to investigate. I think we have all of the information in the Trayvon Martin case. If they were going to bring charges, they probably would have done it by now. Uh, in this case, they certainly have a very full record. Uh, they have, you know, we have over 4,000 pages uh, from the grand jury, and they have their own investigation that they've done. So I, I think it's time to get on with it. I think there is sufficient grounds for him to be charged with federal civil rights violations. Uh, we'll see if they have the gumption to do it. Right, because Darren Wilson is acting as though he's done. He's clear, washed his hands off, taken his money to uh, give ABC an interview, gotten married, uh, resigned from the force. He'll, he's probably become a hero of gun rights activists and, and pro-police folks. Mm -hmm. But the sh story shouldn't be over for him. It, it really shouldn't be over. And, you know, he never even did an incident report. I, I, to me, that should be grounds for termination. I suppose if somebody wants to lawyer up and not talk about killing an unarmed citizen, uh, they have that constitutional right. But I think as a police officer, if you're not even going to explain what you did and fill out the same kind of incident report that was filled out about Mike Brown shoplifting, that was a 16-page incident report. Wow. And there was just one page incident report on this, which just said Officer Wilson's name at the top and then a big blank space where you're supposed to fill in what happened and then his signature at the bottom. I think that should be grounds for termination. I think we should all have the right to know what happened when a police officer shoots and kills someone. And, and people, uh, the authorities in Ferguson, uh, because he has resigned, made a big deal about the fact that he wasn't going to receive a severance. Well, you don't get a severance for resigning, and we're supposed to get, right. consider it a victory that he's not yeah. getting a severance from the police force. I yes. Mean, I mean, it's been in the news all weekend. But I think it's also time to pull back because, you know, as I said in my book about the George Zimmerman case, Suspicion Nation, it's very easy to demonize these individuals like George Zimmerman mm. or like Darren Wilson, and I think they should be demonized. Let me be clear about that. But it, we also need to pull back and talk about how we can prevent this from happening in the future. Certainly, every police officer should have a badge cam like today, immediately. I, I have two video cameras in my purse right now, right? One on my phone, one on my iPad. They're very inexpensive now. They're very good. They're very effective. And in pilot programs, for example, in Rialto, California, they reduce excessive force claims 80%. Wow. So we shouldn't be doing a 20th century investigation of talking to all of these eyewitnesses and trying to sort out what happened. We should be using 21st century technology to see what happens. Let's protect the good cops against false claims. And let's you know, mainly, let's stop killing Americans, especially African Americans. There's just way too much of that going on. And I think people behave better on camera. And I think it's time to get cameras on every police officer. I read a terrible statistic uh, this weekend that uh, police officers are killing African Americans at almost the same rate as black men were lynched during the worst oh. of the Jim Crow era. Well, yeah. Lisa Bloom, oh. what's the best place for people to read your writing, your Twitter uh, feed? Uh, yes, definitely follow me website. on Twitter, at Lisa Bloom. My website is thebloomfirm.com if people are looking for representation. And my personal site is uh, lisabloom.com. Do you sense a theme? Uh, and I love hearing from everybody, especially on social media. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Lisa Bloom is my guest. She's the New York Times bestselling author of Swagger and Think. Her latest book is Suspicion Nation, the inside story of the Trayvon Martin injustice and why we continue to repeat it. And she runs her own law firm in L.A. called The Bloom Firm. This is Uprising. Bipasha Shom is our producer and our program director. Hi, our Radwan is our research intern. Camilo Ramirez and Christian Beck are our production interns. And Annie Mendoza is our media intern. And Dan and Swerdlove is our technical director. Federico Garcia and Jonathan Alexander are our audio engineers. You can subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Uprising with Sonali. Our website is uprisingwithsonali.com. Our theme music is by Ketsal. I'm Sonali Kohatkar, host and executive producer of Uprising. See you tomorrow.